Welcome everybody, this is SharePoint Developer Ecosystem or PMP Community Call. So this is basically the SharePoint Developer Monthly Community Call. And Sean, you should keep yourself muted while I'm actually talking. <laughs> there we go. So this is the monthly community call around the SharePoint developer topics. So we're going to walk through slightly what's the latest on the uh, on the SharePoint development. And from an engineering perspective, we have two different demos today as well. Uh, so let's actually jump in right uh, in the, the uh, agenda. So we're going to talk about certain uh, updates related on user voice updates, monthly summary, other details of what has happened within the last month. Uh, this kind of a walk through uh, what has happened within the last month. Then we're going to have a look on the SharePoint roadmap. So what's actually happening within the short time frame. Right now we're not predicting anything uh, after Ignite. So the Ignite or right after Ignite is our uh, prediction endpoint for the time being. Uh, but uh, let's come. Let's talk about that one when we get to that section. Uh, we'll have also two different demos. Uh, so Sean Squires is going to start around the site designs and site scripts. So there was a summer 2018 release around that one. New capabilities, new actions available. Sean is going to do a live demo on that one and feel uh, obviously give us feedback on those capabilities as well. And then in the end, I'm going to do a quick preview on the SharePoint framework version 1.6, which is uh, estimated to go out in a matter of uh, days or weeks. So pretty soon, uh, way before Ignite. And then by Ignite, we'll have another version. But I'm going to walk up through the main the most important changes in the 2016, uh, sorry, in the SharePoint framework. If we have time, Q&A, uh, most likely knowing Sean and knowing me, <laughs> this is gonna, we're going to fill up the whole hour and, and we do apologize. And now, in practice, because always the monthly community calls will run out of time, that's one of the key reasons why we actually have the special interest group calls. So we do have two different bi-weekly uh, special interest group calls. One is for SharePoint Framework, where we have live demos on SharePoint Framework. We talk about uh, openly in the IAM window around what's happening, the latest improvements, and whatever documentation changes. The next call on the SharePoint Framework is on 26, uh, sorry, 16th of August, so it is this week on Thursday. Uh, we actually have two community demos, and Patrick has promised to do a pretty cool demo on uh, well minimizing bundles for SharePoint Framework. So if you're into the SharePoint Framework, uh, you actually want to be there uh, on next Thursday. Now, the second bi-weekly community call uh, is the, the SP General Dev, and this is the original special interest group call or office uh, hours a while back, and then we've been renaming this quite a few times. But basically, this is everything else except the client side development. So uh, provisioning, CSAM, PMP, Microsoft Graph, Power Apps, uh, Microsoft Flow in the context of SharePoint. We're going to talk about those things in those bi-weekly calls. And now, if you're interested in doing any live demos on this, you are more than welcome to do so. Um, so please reach out to me, Patrick, uh, Chax, or whoever in the team, and uh, we'll get you a spot to do a live demo in the community calls. All of the community calls are getting recorded. Uh, like this call is will have its recording live in our YouTube. YouTube channel within 24 hours after the call has been finished. Um, the monthly community call this one is this one, uh, and obviously the next is September, second Tuesday of September, uh, which is 11th of September. Now, um, there, from Dennis's question, there are two six: one six for SharePoint Framework, one six for SharePoint General Dev, and then the monthly community call. The whole point of this call is just to quickly clarify that one. There's so many calls I can't keep up, and that's fine. The whole point of this call is that you can join based on your interest, based on your availability on these calls, and still ask questions from the other people in the community, from the engineering, and we'll help you as much as we can in the journey. Um, and also, this monthly community calls are mainly for us walk through what has happened within the past month, which means that which means that there isn't that much time for interactivity, unfortunately. So that's why we have two different SIC uh, or special interest groups or specific bi-weekly calls. And most likely, this is absolutely the maximum limit where the calls are going because we can't, we, there's no way of having more. Now, and obviously you can 
watch all of these recordings in the YouTube channel as well. Uh, quick numbers from July 2018. Uh, this most likely isn't super interesting for the community, but it's also interesting probably to understand that there's quite a few other people actually working in the SharePoint community. So the SharePoint development community is actually thriving. Uh, it's, it is growing. Uh, there's a clear interest once again on the SharePoint uh, developer community due to the SharePoint 2019 release and SharePoint framework and all of the cool capabilities what's happening. So people are again highly interested on in what's happening in the space. Uh, in YouTube we had 170,000 uh, uh, minutes in July 2018 uh, and 30,000 views. So you can count how much a single view on average was based on that. We had 39,000, uh, 49,000 unique visitors in GitHub which is great so people can actually find our open source initiatives, our samples. So that's really cool. And there was quite a lot of views in the GitHub as well. Uh, the docs.microsoft.com so the SharePoint dev docs uh, is growing all the time. Uh, we'll probably hit the 1 million in this autumn. Uh, we'll, we will be releasing new material here uh, all the time. For example, the Microsoft Flow and Power Apps, uh, let's say the Makers documentation uh, is going to be released there pretty soon and that's going to uh, increase the views uh, definitely. On the PMP reusable components usage, uh, which we started back in well, technically five years ago, already building this. Now, at the time of last month, uh, they generated uh, 16.2 billion HTTP requests in SharePoint Online, and they were used in more than 14,000 tenants. So this is the PMP PowerShell and also the PMP CSAM Core. Um, and then uh, the most used capability, obviously, once again, was the provisioning engine. Now, what about SharePoint Framework? So for SharePoint Framework, we haven't actually provided uh, any, uh, we haven't actually provided any specific numbers and we are not allowed to do so still, but this gives you the chart or let's say, in, uh, let's say it shows you how the numbers have been growing uh, since last uh, July. So this is one year on the usage of SharePoint, uh, to a SharePoint Framework for third party. So this is not first party, first party meaning uh, meaning out of the box capabilities, this is custom implementations used in SharePoint Online. And SharePoint Framework is by far the most fastest growing customization uh, ever in the history of Office 365. And it's by far the biggest and most widely used customization model uh, in SharePoint, uh, SharePoint, well, in Office 365 in general. So the usage is growing out of this world, to be honest, uh, and it's way beyond what we were thinking, which is great because it proves that the technology is what customers and partners were looking for. And right now we're looking into extending usage of SharePoint Framework to be the de facto way of creating a Microsoft Teams tab. So you'll actually use SharePoint Framework for creating Microsoft Teams tabs and custom experiences in Microsoft Teams. And we're also looking into extending that usage and other areas of Office 365. Now, other things, uh, other things uh, related on uh, kind of a quick news before we go to the actual demos. Obviously, classic slides. I promise to use this in every single slide. Probably been doing that already almost a year already. AKMSSP Dev Docs and uh, Docs, Docs uh, SharePoint Developer Documentation. Uh, from here, you can find all the relevant documentation around SharePoint development. Now with certain exceptions. So the API documentation is in a separate location due to the structure of the docs.microsoft.com. But anyway, all of the guidance and uh, around SharePoint add-in development, farm development, framework development, extensions, even SharePoint 2019 has actually a few pages already uh, in this location. Um, and schema development, feature XML definitions, all of those are available in this one single location. So MSDN is in the journey of getting shut down and we're moving all of the documentation away from there. There are certain API documentations which are still in progress uh, because um, to be full transparency, the people who are responsible of getting the API documentation didn't quite realize how big a SharePoint API is. So they were assuming a really small set of APIs and small set of docs. And when I showed them how much we have see some APIs and server side APIs between 2013, 2016, 2019 and SharePoint Online, they freaked out. So this is gonna take a while uh, on the journey, but we'll get there eventually. Now, um, on the on the other thing, so running into issues on SharePoint, uh, please, please, please let us know. This is a, uh, the issue list in the SP Dev Docs repository is your friend 
for reporting anything in the dev uh, area. So if you call the SharePoint online support and say that, well, this API isn't working, they're actually going to tell you back that, well, we don't support development topics or customizations because they can't, they don't have expertise to do so. So we in engineering, we are trying to help you uh, by giving you a place where you can actually report these issues and we'll then triage them and then we actually assign them to our engineers to getting fixed. Now, we are way behind of the curve of uh, updating some of this stuff and way behind of the curve of triaging this. And we're trying to find the right ways uh, in the future to handle all of the incoming questions and potential issues using this issue list. But please, please, please keep on doing that uh, because that helps us um, on letting us know if there are any critical issues in SharePoint Online. Now, uh, other areas, quick reminder, uh, might have seen this already, SharePoint Developer Block has moved to a new improved platform, which still needs to be improved, but it's already better than the previous one. So now we're in WordPress, uh, so this is already a big improvement for us for writing the documents, but there are certain styling issues and challenges which we still need to fix. And the current, the new platform, which is good, it is still waiting for RSS feeds and all of that stuff, which are coming relatively uh, soon. Now, one of the things what we actually haven't talked about before today uh, is that we are looking into opening up this blog post also for community posting. You will see announcements around that one uh, sooner or later, but the whole point is that we want actually other people to have an opportunity to blog in the official SharePoint developer blog as well. So if you're an MVP or you're, uh, you, you want to contribute uh, here as a community member, you can absolutely soon in the future uh, submit your articles in the SharePoint developer block as well. We'll absolutely review them and make sure that they actually work and they're valid and then we approve them and then we push them out using the official channel. So more news on that one uh, sooner or later. Now, a few news on the uh, user voice. Uh, so not that much actually development here. So not that much movement in here. We do apologize on that. Mainly because we're waiting for announcements uh, in Ignite 2018. So there will be a lot of changes in some of these areas uh, or announcements in some of these areas, especially in SharePoint framework topics, uh, there will be announcements uh, or overlaps with some of these requests. So as an example, the capabilities related on uh, using SharePoint Framework as a development tool for Microsoft, Microsoft Teams tab will tackle some of these things as well. Um, and we're looking into enabling some of these issues or some of these uh, requests by actually implementing them available. To be fair, there are cert also certain capabilities which are requested in here which we are no longer really looking into investing, like allowing publishing of content in content type hub content types using CSAM. The reality is that, for example, the content type hub is something which we really are not looking into investing in the future, which means that we're not looking into having this kind of a CSAM enabled because we need to prioritize those resources in a different area. Um, so, but for example, the managed metadata term store operations and REST API, that is something what we need also out of the box. So we're looking into having that one, hopefully by Ignite, uh, potentially slightly later than that. So I can promise exactly the date for that one, but all maturity of these are getting worked on all the time. Now, um, August 2018 release uh, summary. I'm not going to actually even explain all of this. I want to save some time, but if you go to our dev blogs, uh, the, the SharePoint developer blogs, there's a long summary on what has happened within the August 2018. There was a lot of new samples, so thank you, uh, which the community contributed, so thank you humongously on those. There was a lot of uh, contributions also on the document side and also in our open source uh, initiatives. And those are extremely useful uh, because we rather see us as an engineer working together with you and building open source initiatives, building open source tooling, uh, rather than having a multiple different uh, isolated projects built by different people. So working together on a specific tools and reusable tooling is really what we're going to do inside of, inside of the SharePoint engineering as well. Um, not going to go through all of these. They are mentioned in the blog post, which went live earlier today. But the key point, what I wanted to spend some time is to really provide uh, appreciation or make sure that people understand that we really, really appreciate your contribution. So we once again had a 
really big list of people contributing uh, within the last month in our open source initiatives in the github or in the in the community channels we and we thank you humongously uh, on doing so uh, also uh, in future hopefully but a lot of the people there's new people here a lot of people here are also familiar from the past a lot of them are MVPs or people who want to be an MVP in the future and contributing in the community channels is one way of getting also that MVP stamp or keeping the MVP stamps so really really great to see so many people contributing now, this is the list of companies which we have a permission to show the logo from the previous list of people. So these companies are basically promoting the community work and promoting their people to contribute on the on the community and open source efforts and what we're running as a Microsoft. So thank you for those companies for giving their uh, employees the opportunity for uh, contributing and working within the open, open source initiatives. Now, if your company, if you contributed and your company is not here, please send us an email or a message using LinkedIn, social media, tech community, whatever channels, and let us know and give your permission and the logo so we can use that in the future uh, in this announcement. Now, um, on the Microsoft side, um, we have a quick list of people here. I probably missed some people here, but the, the Microsoft side of people consists from our technical writers, from our engineers, from our uh, actually Microsoft internal community members. So thank you very much for your uh, contributions as well. Now, quick look on the roadmap before we go to the site designs and site scripts, and then after that, we'll come back on the SharePoint framework. So I'm going to not deep dive on the SharePoint framework uh, roadmap in here, but 1.6 for SharePoint framework is the next bigger release, which is going to happen end of August. So but before end of August. So we'll look to in, talking about now days or week or so or so, something around that when we get the SharePoint framework 1.6 out. And really the biggest big things here are the native Microsoft Crafts access from SharePoint framework and GA of that one. So you can actually start using that in production and also the global deployment of uh, SharePoint framework. And I'm gonna explain what the global deployment of SharePoint framework will actually mean in practice in the demo when we get to the demo section on my side. Uh, over, uh, and then we're looking into having support for React 16 potentially, preview of Socket IO and SharePoint 2019 Yoma support. I'm gonna talk about those one slightly more detailed after Sean's uh, session or Sean time. SharePoint Framework 1.6 is now estimated to uh, happen right after Ignite. So we're going to demo that in Ignite, we, uh, where we're going to demonstrate Microsoft Teams development using SharePoint Framework and also exposing ISV solutions from Microsoft Teams in SharePoint. So doing SharePoint web parts in meet teams as a tab, but also the, the ISVs which are in the teams, they can actually expose their customizations in SharePoint. So it doesn't really matter are you targeting teams or SharePoint, your customization will work in both, which is a great, great uh, solution. And obviously SharePoint framework in, is uh, supported in SharePoint 2019, preview started uh, on SharePoint 2019 on 24th of July. So you can already download the SharePoint 2019, install that and play around with that one. So, all good. Now, at this point, let's actually move to Sean. Sean Squires is on the call, uh, and Sean is gonna talk about uh, SharePoint site designs and site scripts. I'm gonna be your uh, lovely assistant, uh, clicking on <laughs> slides. <So>. Thanks, guys. <laughs> and then I can flip on your screen when the screen sharing is needed. But I'm gonna go to a following slide, so you can actually start talking. Perfect. Great. Thanks. Thanks, guys. So good morning, everybody. Yeah, let's. Uh, I just uh, have a couple of quick slides, then we'll jump over to my screen, and I can show you guys a bunch of demos. Um, so good morning. Uh, so a couple things uh, we wanted to share with you uh, this morning uh, around site designs. Uh, one, uh, this first one, site designs for hubs. This is one that we actually announced uh, at the beginning of summer at the SharePoint conference in Vegas. Um, and demoed it. Uh, we're getting it ready for ship. It should start to go out to targeted release uh, by the end of the month. So we're trying to get this out before we sort of put the lockdown uh, uh, prior to Ignite. Um, the exciting thing about this is, uh, as for those of you who aren't familiar with this, site designs, as you know right now, are largely intended to be applied uh, through the self-site creation flow or to existing sites uh, using PowerShell. 
And what we wanted to do was sort of continue to build on the power and flexibility of hubs by providing the ability to target, to essentially uh, set a site design to be applied to any site that joins a hub. So imagine if you've got a bunch of sites when they're joining a hub, you want to make sure that uh, a certain uh, user group gets added to the uh, owner role of that uh, joined site, or you want to apply a certain library or configuration to that joined site. You can do that now with the site design for hubs. Um, what this allows you to do is we actually have a UX that allows you to specify a site design. And then uh, when sites join, they can be executed. We've also made an, uh, an, an amendment to the, uh, <clears throat> um, to the uh, set uh, SPO hub site uh, PowerShell commandlet and CSOM so that you can actually set the site design association uh, through PowerShell as well. Uh, let's see, what else? Um, notice that second bullet. These designs are published globally and can be used on one or more hubs. So let me explain that for a second because this is sort of part one of where we're going with this. Uh, right now what we've done is effectively exposed the set of site designs that you're publishing for the tenant, okay? And so what you can do is you can publish that uh, site design and then associate it uh, with, to a hub. One of the things you, you will have to do is if you want to make sure that that site design is only used for that hub, you will have to use the scoping feature to effectively hide it from uh, the uh, self-site provisioning flow. Now, uh, we understand that that's not optimal, but our plan is this is really just the first step. We wanted to get this capability out there. Our next plan is to really start to distribute the storage of site design. So imagine being able to uh, publish a site design to the HR hub, and then it's just available for use there. It's not exposed to the rest of the tenant, so you can really start to uh, create local uh, uh, hub-specific site designs. So that's that plan there. Um, we also have a lot more in store for this uh, feature space, but just wanted to introduce that, and I'll demo this real quickly uh, when we jump over to my screen. Let's uh, quickly jump through the other things I want to cover with you guys this morning. That's the next slide. Absolutely. Now, there was one good question, though, from David, which was any trigger when a site is disconnected from a hub. That's good feedback uh, for the feature. So. Oh, yeah, that is good feedback. I'm sorry. I missed that. Sorry, guys. I'm, uh, let me try and make sure I'm looking at no the worries, window. No uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, David. Yeah, yeah, that is a great question. Right now, as you can see there, uh, we are only – we're more of an additive, uh, so when you join a hub, uh, site design one will be applied. If you were to disassociate or unjoin from that hub and then join hub two that had a different site design, that site design would be applied. But at no time are we uh, unsite designing your site or are we uh, applying a site design when you unjoin. But that's that, good feedback. That's a great, great term, unsite designing. <laughs> Let's not publish that. <laughs> okay, uh, I, I hope this makes, uh, as a matter of fact, this is a good one. Um, so I hope this one makes everybody happy because uh, I've gotten some great feedback like, hey, Sean, this is super that site designs are available for modern team and calm, but I have a whole bunch of existing classic sites. How can I use site designs there? Well, I'm happy to say that uh, we have uh, uh, enabled it for these additional templates. Uh, for a couple reasons. One, because you asked, and we see the value there, but also uh, this will actually help the feature I just talked about. We know that there are a lot of sites that will be joining hubs that are classic sites or um, even as we roll out right now, uh, the new groupless modern team site, that STS Pound 3, we wanted to make sure that we were providing a mechanism for uh, those to be available and could have site designs applied to them. So these are the three uh, templates that we have uh, made available. Um, let's see, real quickly, I'm going to show you an example of this because guess what? Uh, you can also uh, apply this to subsites as well. So I will show you how to use the uh, an example of using the invoke SPO site design uh, command to uh, uh, to apply uh, uh, to these templates as well. Uh, let's see, real quickly, questions: Are these only for hub site designs? No. These are for all of them, uh, for, the, for all three of those, regardless of whether they're a site collection, a subsite, or a hub site. Okay, let's see. Oh, 
Oh, and, and sorry, no, I'm flipping the slides. My bad. My bad. <laughs> no, Your lovely assistant is, is messing up your flow. There was a good question around the modern subsites from Akel. Answer is yes, yes. Uh, modern subsite is, is available. Is it when? Uh, oh, yeah. So let me talk about that real quickly, just because that's uh, very germane to this conversation. So as you guys probably saw, Mark and I just published about a week ago, two weeks ago, um, a blog post to the tech community um, about a whole bunch of self-site creation updates. These are starting to roll out now. Uh, they can be summarized as uh, four uh, major updates. Uh, the first is uh, to uh, self-site creation. What we've done is we've amended the uh, admin experience to effectively modernize it if you uh, if your tenant does not allow for group creation. So if you're familiar with the self-site creation experience today, if your tenant uh, if you've disabled group creation, we essentially, and you have self-site creation on, we effectively, uh, uh, fall, uh, you fail over to uh, classic site creation only. <clears throat> Not an optimal experience, and it also prevents you from making comm sites, which have nothing to do with groups. So we wanted to fix that, um, and I'm happy to say that we have. So now what you can do is, even if you have a tenant where self-site creation is enabled, <clears throat> but uh, group uh, creation is disabled, you can now make a modern team site and a comm site, okay? That modern team site is, as I say on the slide there, effectively just a groupless modern team site. It really is very similar to our uh, group pound zero template, just without the, all the group stuff attached to it. Um, the other piece that's related to this is uh, we've obviously done the logic updates to the self-site provisioning UX, so that what will happen is that experience will respond based on your uh, admin settings, and which is really cool because now it gives a more consistent uh, indexing and leaning towards modern uh, experience for your users when you have self-site creation enabled. Also in that form, we've added uh, default language support. So now instead of being stuck with whatever the uh, tenant's admin setting is, you can go ahead and specify an alternate language at the time of creation. And finally, the fourth piece is uh, subsite creation. Uh, we've extended the subsite creation options because we're really trying to uh, push people more towards using, uh, that's the wrong word, uh, we're trying to guide people more <laughs> towards using hub sites. And we wanted to make sure that in doing so, uh, we made it easier for admins to be able to turn off or restrict where subsite creation is enabled. So you can actually turn it off uh, through the UI uh, for all uh, site templates um, or just for your modern ones. So those are new options. Those are rolling out now. And then finally, uh, the STS Pound 3, that new groupless modern team site, for those who do enable subsite creation, we want to add it to the uh, subsite creation menu so that you can, if you're making modern site collections, you can now make uh, modern subsites. Did cool. I get all the questions? Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I think you Super. All right, yeah, I want to make sure uh, I'm watching the clock here because as Vesa says, yes, he and I are very talkative. Uh, let's see. Uh, you, you, don't wanna, yeah. you, do, you don't want to sit on our meetings when we're having a meeting. You want, you want to get strong. <laughs> Those are horrible. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> All right, uh, and finally, the last slide. Uh, new script actions. Yeah, so just real quickly, a couple of these uh, went out earlier, but uh, some have gone out more recently. These are the three main ones, add principle to group, uh, fairly self-explanatory, I'll illustrate that, but that works for uh, uh, licensed users, security groups, and Office 365 groups. Uh, the remove nav link, that was really intended to just sort of, since you're applying a site design to one of our templates that already has like a default set of uh, site nav links, we wanted to give the ability to edit those, I mean to remove those. Uh, I have heard the feedback, so if you're interested, uh, I know that there's a lot of interest in having uh, more control over the configuration of the nav, like being able to make a, a, a post, a, I'm sorry, a nav link, a sublink of a parent, and that is absolutely in the backlog. I can't promise I'll have that for you by Ignite, but it's definitely something that we plan to get to as soon as we can. Uh, the create site column XML and the add SP lookup, that's a uh, couple things. Uh, one, that was intended so that you can now use site column X, uh, I'm sorry, field XML to create site columns, which is super awesome because then you can start adding it to content types and things like that. And this also enabled us to um, do the uh, lookup. So we can now actually, um, uh, you can actually configure a list 
and then make it a lookup list and reference it from another list all through the site script. And I'll give you an example of that um, in just a minute. And you'll see there, there's a link there to samples. Thank you, Vesa. Vesa got back from vacation. This was one of the first things I threw at him and said, Vesa, I've got a bunch of samples. I need your help. And so he got those published uh, earlier this week or last week, I believe. So uh, thank you. And go check those out. And I'm going to illustrate a couple of those uh, this morning. You should really start learning GitHub as well, so I don't need to do that for you. But anyway, that's it. <laughs> I, I know, I know, I know. <laughs> sure, cool. So let's go to your demo. So let's see some of those in practice. Uh, uh, so crossing fingers that screen sharing works for you. So that's yeah. Let's see. Let's see. Seamlessly. Let's see if it makes it gives me an option to do the window primary monitor. It did not give me an option to specify which monitor. So hopefully. Let's see what happens. Let's see where we land. It is loading three dots. It is loading. And I got it. Hey, slow. I can see myself. Woohoo. Uh oh, that's not the one I want. Hold on. Of course not. Is there a. Why is there no option to change? Okay, this might be interesting. I can't. Uh, <laughs> Manage presentable content. What is this? That's a. Uh, oh, that's here we for go. managing, yeah, what's going on. Yeah, I'm just um, trying to see if there's. No. Oh, this is going to be fun. Okay, I got everything backwards, guys. Excuse me for one second. We're going to have to switch all this around. I don't know why it's not giving me an option to switch monitors. That's, am I missing it's, something it's here? Skype meeting app, not Skype for business. I think that's the problem now. So. All right. All right. That's going to be fun because that's my much smaller monitor. <laughs> <laughs> so which companies actually implemented the Skype thing? Because why isn't they always having these problems? So I don't get it. So. <laughs> What are you guys seeing? Are you seeing uh, my yes, uh, man's the, the administrator power show? Yes. Oh, perfect. Okay. All right. Well, well, bear with me. We're going to be flipping a lot of screens here. Uh, so we'll let's get started. Okay. Hi. Right. So the first one I wanted to show you. Actually, let me make sure that I've got my demo stuff together, so I'm not completely crazy here. All right. Here we go. Okay. Um, let's do the first one. Uh, site designs for hubs. So. Uh, as I mentioned, you can take a published site design and associate it with a hub. And so one of the things that we can do here is uh, I am on this environment. I've got a travel guide hub. You'll see that I've got the site ID here. So that's my, that's my hub. And then I've also got a site design here called the SPC travel guide. That has already been uh, created. It's already got a site script. And you'll see there if there's its ID there. So what I can do is I can go ahead and use the... Uh, uh, the set uh, SPO hub site commandlet, and I can pass in the ID of the hub, and I can also pass in the ID of the site design. And what the, this is, a, this site design ID is a new parameter that allows us to do that association. So just to show you what I'm doing here, uh, here is the hub in the UX, and you'll see that under the hub site settings, there is a new option here: site design applied to associated site on join. Um, this is empty right now. Uh, but what it's doing is it's actually doing a lookup against all the site designs that are on this uh, tenant. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and run this command here, and I think it just did it. Let's go. Let's make sure it did. We're going to go back here. Oops. And you'll see that that SP travel guide has now been associated with uh, this hub. Okay. So just to show you that you can actually do this either through the UX or you can do it um, uh, through PowerShell. Okay, so now that we've got a site design associated with this hub, what that means is when a, um, oh, this is going to be fun. Here we go. Uh, if I have a site that I want to join that hub, uh, a couple things are going to happen. The typical joining actions are going to happen so that I get the hub site map and things like that, but also that site design is going to be executed as well. So if we look real quickly at what that site script is doing, just to show you kind of what's happening here, let's, um, it's this guy right here. What I'm doing is I'm just creating a couple of site columns, okay? And then once I have those site columns, I'm creating a content type. And then once I have that content type, I'm creating a new list called travel journals, and I'm adding that content type, adding a couple of other fields, and then uh, setting some formatting and applying a view. So essentially, I'm just creating a new list 
that gets applied to the site when it joins. So if I go to one of these sites, go into the site information screen, and I want to go and find that hub, and boy, this is going to be fun with my smaller screen. Let's get down to the travel guide hub. I'm going to go ahead and join that. And what's happening today, the web was being updated. Uh-oh, what did I do? I wonder if I timed this thing out. Hey, here we go. Okay, so a couple things just happened. Let me point them out to you. So I, I just took this Travel Guide Thailand uh, modern comm site, joined it to the Travel Guide hub. Obviously, it's uh, got the um, uh, hub site nav that's been added, but check it out. There's also a script that was run, and that Travel Journals link was added to the site. Cool? And that is that. Okay. <laughs> Amazing. Oh, thank you. I can't see anything because I'm on the small screen. All right, there we go. Hi, everybody. <laughs> All right, next next demo. What are we doing next? Uh, uh, let's see, let's see, let's see. Oh, apply site designs to other site templates. Yes, let's do that. Okay, let's go back to um, this guy here. All right, so what I want to illustrate here is um, uh, – that I can take a published site design and I can apply it not only to an existing uh, site, but better yet, I'm going to apply it to a subsite. Okay. So what I have here is, uh, let me go to my environment real quick. Here we go. Apologies for all the mad windows scrolling here. Okay. So you'll see here that I have a um, uh, a site on the, on my tenant called appropriately enough STS Pound Three Demo. Uh, this is using the new modern uh, site template, uh, team site template, so there is no group associated with this site. I've even gone so far as to create a couple of subwebs that are also using the new modern template. So I've got uh, this one here and this one here. And this one is actually called STS Pound 3 Subweb B. So what I'm going to do is if we go ahead and go to Subweb B, which I believe no, I don't have it here. Okay, so let's go ahead and go to Subweb B. So you'll see that this is just a um, another site, a sub subsite that's uh, living under this guy. I'm going to go ahead and apply a site design to this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this site design. Uh, the ID is a one da 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 da. It's going to go and create some lookup columns in a list. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and use my invoke command. And I'm going to apply this site design to uh, this web URL. And specifically, I'm going to apply it to this subsite. Okay? And we'll give that just a second. It should be fresh. Hopefully, I didn't time myself out. Maybe I did. What did I do here? Sorry, right, let's try this again. Okay, it's not liking that. Let's uh let's see if I just go ahead. It must not like something I'm doing here. So first, I'm going to go ahead and grab the identity, and then the web URL I'm going to grab is going to be this guy here. Uh, maybe that was the problem. All right. Apologies for that typo user error. All right. So what just happened? So I just used the invoke command, and I just essentially executed that site design against that subweb. Uh, which is an STS pound free uh, site template. And you'll see that essentially what I did was I created a bunch of site columns, content type, created a, a list. I actually created two lists because uh, I wanted to create the Contoso project list and this project tracker, which is going to be doing the lookup stuff. So now if I jump back to this site and refresh it and go to the site contents, Yay, we'll 
you'll see that there's a couple new lists there. And since we're here, uh, let me just quickly illustrate. This is actually using the new um, uh, lookup command. Uh, I'm sorry, some of the new uh, uh, lookup script actions. Let me jump to those real quick. So essentially the script that I just ran, you'll see that we've got this new create site column XML uh, action, which allows me to use field XML to create a site column, which is awesome because then I can go ahead and take that and add those to a content type. And then notice that what I'm doing here is I'm creating a couple lists. The first one I'm creating is this Contoso project list. And what I'm doing here is this has got uh, the content type that I just uh, defined up above. But then I'm also using the field XML, at SP field XML action to add a couple of additional fields and customize the view. And then I'm also creating uh, another list called the project tracker list. Okay, so the first one was the project list. Sorry about that. First, second one's the project tracker list. But what's super cool about this one is I can now actually reference um, right here add SP lookup field XML. So this new action, I can actually look up a field that lives in the first list that I created. So now I can actually use lookup columns and declare them in my site scripts when I execute these guys. So if we go and take a look at that super quick, um, let's see, if I go to my Contoso project list, And let's see, if I just create something real quickly here, uh, let's see, there's a in progress. Let's go ahead and change this to in review. We'll change it to engineering. Oops. Give it a title. All right. So now that I've actually added something to that list, you'll see if I now go to the project tracker list and create a new item here. you'll see that those items are now available as options here. Cool? All right. Really cool. Hey. Hey. Okay. <laughs> uh, let's see. What else do I have up here? So let's see. We've gone through the hub site design. We've gone through applying uh, site designs to other templates. I uh, started to show you some of the script actions. Let's go look at a couple more of the script actions uh, super quick. I've got two more for you. How are we doing on time, Bessa? Thank you. Uh, I can... uh, you have max uh, six minutes. So hopefully... Six minutes? Okay. All right. I should be able to do this in six minutes. Uh, let's see. Um, where am I? Am I on the right environment? I think so. Yes. Okay. So let's see. Uh, the, the other one that we did was there is a new... Um, uh, a new script action to add principles to SP groups. And essentially what this one is doing is, uh, uh, let's see, I think I have kept the script up. Let's see if I did. I might not have added that one. Uh, let's see if we can get rid of this guy. No, I did not have that one. Let me show you what this one looks like real quick. <clears throat> So this one's pretty straightforward, actually. What this one is doing is it's just illustrating adding different types of uh, principles uh, to the group. This could be super powerful. In fact, one of the things that was really motivating this was uh, when we were seeing the power of applying site designs to hubs, obviously a really cool thing to do would be to say, hey, when a site gets created or when a site joins a hub, let's make sure that certain users or uh, user groups like admins or support get added uh, to that site with the right uh, role uh, so that they can go ahead and troubleshoot or support uh, should that be needed. So what this is illustrating is just here's the different type of principles. You can add security groups, mail-enabled security groups, O365 groups, and even users. And so what this one does is, let's see, add principles And I don't know why I made this a team site, because now we're going to make the group. I think I did it because I wanted to make sure that certain groups could be added as well. But fortunately, site creation is so fast. And let's see what this script is doing here. So you'll see it's adding, um, I, I just for reference sake, I went ahead and added uh, uh, the link to the user group to the site nav. But I'm adding a... Uh, this principle TSFSG, that's just a security group that I created on my environment to the owner's group. 
Then I'm adding a particular, uh, let's see, a mail-enabled security group to the members group. And then finally, I am adding, uh, looks like I added Joe user to the owners group as well. And then also a uh, modern team, uh, that's another uh, O365 group to the visitors group. So if we go ahead and refresh this, you'll see there's that user group link. And just real quickly, you'll see if you look at like something like the owners, there's Joe user that's been added. So super useful. Hopefully uh, you find value in that action. Uh, I think I'm down to two minutes. I've got one more for you guys. Um, let's see. My last one was, oh, removing site links. Let's go ahead and do that one real quick. Okay, so, um, oh, there is remove site links. Oh, that's also a team site, sorry. I'm trying to remember where I put some of these demos. Okay, here we go, remove default site links. This one's good because it just illustrates on a uh, group connected team site all the things that we can remove. This is super useful if uh, you want to really control that experience. We've gotten great feedback from everybody saying, hey, great, adding links is perfect, but there's certain default links that I don't want on my sites when they get created. Can you give me a way to remove them? Yes, we have a new action that does that now. So you'll see what this one is intended to do is really just to illustrate removing everything. So uh, as soon as I update this, voila, <laughs> the site nav effectively disappears. Uh, and then you're probably asking me, gee, Sean, that's a neat demo. How do I get my links back? Well, you're going to have to go into the uh, into a classic page in this example and go ahead and add something back since I've effectively removed everything. But uh, <laughs> there it is, just showing the power of removing the links. <laughs> um, so in, in conclusion, uh, lots of cool, fun new things. Uh, eager for you guys' feedback. If you uh, would like to see... Uh, uh, work, get some working samples of this. We've got a bunch of uh, new samples posted to the GitHub repo. And Ignite, right around the corner. Uh, a couple questions that came up while Vesa was doing the uh, overview around action limits and the managed metadata field. So real quickly, we will have more information to share with you next month at Ignite around uh, action limits. We realize as we keep giving you all these great, powerful actions, uh, that 30 uh, limit is starting to become a real uh, hassle. So we've got some uh, things that we'll be sharing with you on how to work around that and start running larger and larger scripts. So I'm excited to share that news in a few weeks. And then finally, with the managed metadata field, um, I, we are working as quickly as we can to make something uh, work there. It's really a partnership with our publishing team to make sure that we get the right uh, API updates there so that we can make something that's easier to configure. Uh, that's a complex data type, but we also get that it's a uh, widely used one, and we want to make sure that we have a way to support it. So, and maybe uh, one thing to actually notice uh, during the, the, your presentation, there was a question around how could I modify the welcome page of the site? And for time being, there's no native support from a JSON scripting perspective. So you'd have to call a flow, which calls then an Azure function or something like that, uh, which then uses PMP provisioning for welcome page. But in the long run, we're looking into making that happen, right? Absolutely, yeah, exactly what Bessa said. I mean, we, we uh, take advantage of the uh, of the flow and using uh, all the greatness that uh, is available in the PMP uh, provisioning model. Um, the the challenge there, just candidly, is uh, we need a better uh, uh, modern Pages API. That you know, a lot of the script actions that uh, we provide to you guys is uh, all really built on uh, uh, APIs, and so. We need something that's a little bit more robust there that allows us to work with the modern page canvas and obviously with uh, a lot of the new web parts so that we can give you the means in a script to properly reference them and then, uh, you know, uh, do those applications. But uh, honestly, that's like the, the top scenario for me that I would, you know, I, I can tell you now we're not going to have that at Ignite, but we should have an update and we're looking to, you know, get something to everyone soon because we know that that's, a huge scenario that will unblock a lot of uh, adoption here. But now, Sean, why isn't all of these things ready by a snap of a fingers? What do you mean? You don't have infinite resources? <laughs> no, I'm sorry. Sorry. <laughs> we do apologize. No, no, no. no. So, yeah.
So, okay, um, I have nine minutes, so let's quickly have a look on the SharePoint Framework uh, 1.6. I'm going to pinpoint certain things, what's going to happen here uh, around 1.6. I'm going to do a kind of an ugly live demo of the globally uh, tenant-wide deployment of SharePoint Framework extensions. So just explaining what it is and what's going to happen. So 1.6, um, there was actually a mistake in the previous slide around 1.6. So the, the React 16 transition doesn't happen in 1.6. It will most likely happen in 1.6. And we do apologize if that's, an, that's something what we've been waiting for. Uh, it, again, it's a resourcing challenge, like Sean has resourcing challenges of making some of his stuff done. Um, there's a resourcing challenges in our team responsible of SharePoint Framework for making all of the things what we want to do available. Now, this is currently the list of what we are targeted on releasing. So tenant-wide deployment of SharePoint Framework extensions. So you're able to push extensions to specific site types or specific sites from the app catalog. And I'm going to show that one in practice today. Uh, GA, as meaning uh, production ready, graph and third party web API calls from SharePoint Framework. So that's going to be available in 1.6. Uh, GA of Dialog Framework. This is more, <laughs> to be fair, this is leftovers. We forgot to get rid of the beta markers of those APIs. So Dialog Framework is going to be then GA after 1.6. Preview of Socket IO. So we're looking into doing easier. Um, Let's say you, you're able to subscribe events from a list super easily. So your web part can then react when somebody is uploading a file to the site or a document library or a list, and you can easily do stuff. Um, and yes, uh, thank you, Andrew, for that question. Um, that's that's a similar kind of a leftover that, well, well, we should have just marked that to be a GA. So there's a beta markers in SP HTTP client patch, and that's going to be removed uh, in, in this release. That's a, such a small thing, but anyway. And SharePoint 2019 support is, is uh, going to be in 1.6. So there will be three choices when you target an environment. You're able to say, is this web part or an extension targeted for SharePoint Online, which is the latest, or SharePoint 2019 forward, or SharePoint 2016 forward. And based on your selection, we then create the package JSON with the matching uh, uh, versions of the NPM packages, which will then work properly. Um, which is obviously useful. And there, there will be other things and issues what we will be fixing. Uh, so that will, that's going to be helpful as well. Um, so Dennis is asking, so SP2019 will support an unreleased version of SharePoint SPFX 21.6 through later. Now, SharePoint 2019 will support SharePoint Framework 1.4.1, technically. Now, right now, uh, doing development for SharePoint uh, Online and SharePoint 2019 in a single setup is difficult for you because you need to install 1.4.1 um, technically to make your solutions to work. With 1.6, we will give you the option that you can, as a developer, run 1.6 and based on the, the human selection, will give you the right version in the package JSON. So that's how it will work. So in practice, but let's, uh, I, I do not have that many minutes, uh, but I want to quickly show the tenant wide deployment uh, in practice. So let me jump into my one of the tenants. So this is eDoc. So this is super, 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 super early tenant uh, compiled uh, eight hours ago. So this is really, really latest code. So hopefully I'm not seeing anything which I shouldn't be showing you. Now, when we do development, uh, let me actually do that first. So let me go to the Visual Studio code. This is uh, a solution which I already scuffled. Uh, so this basically is a 1.6 uh, pre-version. So I'm going to show you that here. It's a 1.6 dev 8. Uh, so this is our internal release uh, versions, which we're using for testing and verifying that everything is fine. Now, because we're looking into releasing, um, releasing the tenant-wide uh, deployment, uh, that means that we actually, as part of extension creation, if you choose an extension, we give you a new, completely new file, which is called client-side instance.xml. And what this one actually does is that this, by default, if you package this solution, it will, by default, light up this extension in those locations where you actually want just by adding the SPPK, SPPKT file to the app catalog. So let me show you that one in practice and then we can actually figure out what it means. And uh, let me actually, let's close those and let me actually 
Open up. No, not that one. Why am I? I'm still in the integrated terminal. There it is. I'm learning a, a completely new keyboard layout, so, uh, so bear with me. Um, so, so let me do got bundle uh, and ship. Uh, I'm moving away from finished keyboard layout to do numerous reasons to ENUS uh, International. Uh, but it's a longer story. I'm not going to explain that from here. So uh, I'm going to package the solution um, and I'm going to do a call uh, package uh, solution and that's the ship. Uh, so we can actually use the asset packaging. So JavaScript files uh, are inside of the solution or inside of the uh, of the package. And then I'm going to do uh, explorer and let's open up the explorer and let me actually get rid of the navigation pane so uh, there's nothing too confidential information shown there so there's my call demo so now if i open up my uh, tenant which has been enabled this capabilities uh, i can actually track and drag uh, this solution inside of my app catalog and in this case because it contains that specific javascript file or sorry uh, uh, xml file it's going to actually say that uh, a new message. This package contains an extension which will be automatically enabled across sites. You can control the setting using globally deployed components list at the app catalog site collection. So by default, because that XML file exists in the SPPKJ file, we can actually light up this extension across the whole tenant. If you don't want to do this, you as a tenant administrator need to understand what this message actually means. And you can go to the developer and say, well, I don't want to actually do that. I'm going to target the, site, target the functionality to a, for example, communication sites or only group associated team sites, not to all of the sites. Now, in this case, I'm going to actually enable this uh, in all of the sites, so, and that's fine. And there we go. Uh, it is actually saying that the deployment failed, which is a false, but this is an e-doc, so this is super, super early environment, so don't worry about that. Now, in my case, I actually then deployed an extension. I think it was a relatively ugly application customizer, which actually pops up and message in the dialog. So now, anywhere in my tenant, because we actually added that entry automatically to the application catalog globally deployment list, that extension is getting lighter. So now if I need to control this behavior, I can actually go to the app catalog, I can go to the site content, and we can actually see a tenant wide extensions list where we want to actually modify this behavior. And I can see that I have currently three different uh, application uh, extensions lighting up in my tenant. One of them is lighting up on every single web template. One of them is lighting up in SDS3. And one of them is lighting up completely imaginary SDS4. So it doesn't actually light up anywhere. So in this case, I actually want to get rid of this. Uh, I can actually, I can delete the item. I can do a filtering of the extension uh, to another location or another template if needed, uh, depending on my settings. So basically, you have a one centralized location where you can control how your SharePoint extensions are working and behaving across your tenant. And that's pretty, pretty cool. Uh, and that gives you a flexibility. Right now, this does require understanding of what these things actually mean. So in my case, I'm if I'm going to do SDS4 here, it's going to basically mean that this extension is not going to be executed anywhere because there is no such site as SDS4. Uh, so if I'm in the publishing site, you can say that the publishing the extension isn't actually any more getting uh, lighting up. Now I'm going to take a few more minutes uh, on extra time. So I'm going to add a new entry on my tenant wide extensions. Uh, as an example, I'm going to target my extension only to be executed, uh, or one of the extensions only to be executed in publishing sites. So let's actually do that. So I have an extension with a unique ID. Uh, let's call this extension uh, demo. And this particular extension has a configurations of uh, top and uh, bottom uh, bottom properties. 
So this is relatively technical stuff for the developers to actually define. I want to target that for communication sites. I'm able to say a web template should be a site page publishing has one, sorry, has zero, which is a communication site which is getting created. And then I need to define the location. And in this case, uh, because it's a placeholder based customization, uh, it actually means that I'm uh, enabling that in the location called client site extension dot application customizer. Now, one thing to maybe notice here, there is a list template option here as well. So basically this works for list view command sets. So you're able to push buttons and all of those functionalities in the list level as well using the tenant wide uh, custom tenant wide deployment option. So let me add that entry in. And there we go. Uh, where is that uh, standard? Uh, that's a different. There is a footer for comms. Uh, it is that kind of a, a component ID. Now, if I go to my communication site, if I do a refresh, we can actually see that that particular extension, uh, super, super ugly, I'm just using two different placeholders, is lighting up automatically in every single uh, co uh, communication site the ones which already exist or the ones which I'm actually going to create because it's a runtime configuration uh, of the site. So now if I create a site, so let's create a communication site because this doesn't take that long. So let's call that comms2. One, two, three, four, five. Sean has done an awesome job creating uh, on the site creation creation. There we go. And there's my new communication site and my extensions are lighting up. So you can easily configure these things. Um, and obviously you can disable things in the same way. So if needed, uh, I can absolutely go here or I can go and say, uh, I can reconfigure uh, community call. I can reconfigure my extension, click save. Uh, if I go to my communication site, see it here, that's a footer for comms and let's refresh. Now it's actually going to say uh, communicate community call. So it actually updated that value, updated the behavior of the extension based on my configuration uh, on the sites. And, and like I said, uh, this absolutely works on the existing sites, new sites, it doesn't really matter. It's a runtime resolution. Uh, so that works in a way, uh, right way. And you're able to target uh, the configuration uh, on the list. Now, we do acknowledge uh, that this is relatively, let's say, rough way of configuring this. Uh, so in the long run, we're looking into having potentially a central admin or admin UI where end user can, or administrator can go. He can drop from a drop down select which extension, which web templates without understanding what is an SDS has uh, three or site popsing zero. Uh, and he can select that, well, this works in a, in a as a placeholder or application customizer, and you can easily do that. But as a starting point, uh, this is already enabling the scenario where you're able to push your extensions available without any additional magic from one centralized location from your app catalog uh, across the whole tenant in any way you want. And that is absolutely great and, and completely understandable request what the customers have been having. Cool. So uh, 1.6 is coming out uh, end of August. Uh, original plan was actually come out in the uh, end of July, but there were certain timings and challenges what we, were, uh, we, we needed to delay the release. So right now, end of August is deadline and we're looking into actually keeping up on that one, that uh, deadline right now. So no known delays at this point. So this functionality will be lighting up when the SharePoint framework 1.6 comes out. Uh, technically, the server side, it is a server side functionality. You wouldn't actually need to have a changes on client side, but we're releasing that at the same time as the SharePoint framework 1.6. Uh, so whenever you see the announcements uh, in the blog posts, in the social media, you'll know that that functionality is available and you don't have to do any additional tricks to enable your scenarios. Cool, we have five minutes uh, over the time. We do apologize it's, it's, if it's me and Sean talking, uh, this is what actually always happens. Um, like I said, if we have one-to-ones with Sean, uh, we typically talk 25 minutes of uh, nonsense and then five minutes business. So that's <laughs> what happens. But um, please uh, give us feedback. Thank you for joining on this call. The recording will be available in the YouTube channel within 24 hours. And I will do a blog post in the SharePoint dev blog. Uh, to follow up on uh, things um, on that. Now, if you have any questions, if you have any issues or challenges, which we were unable to address today, please join on our 
uh, other community call, the, the bi-weekly community calls, and, and we'll try to figure out at the right timing for addressing our questions, or use the tech community SharePoint Dev uh, groups for asking assistance, or go to the issue list, which was mentioned in the earlier on in this call, and report an issue, and we'll try to find time to support in, uh, your question. But thank you, everybody. Thank you, Sean, for your input. Thank you, everybody, for joining. Thank you for great interactive discussion in Iron Window. I really love seeing that. Uh, and yes, we need some outro music. Thank you, Mark. Uh, and thank you for, for super valuable input on the, on the, in general, on the functionalities. See you later. Bye-bye. Absolutely. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it.